no okay. you look like i mean you, you know you, you look you look so good all the time and that's part of my introduction for you thank you for you yeah this is part this is part of it i know and oh gee everybody it's uh shit it's it's 502 it's 502 and it's wednesday and uh how do we know it's Wednesday? Because yesterday was Blackout Tuesday, and it's such serious times. I know we're making we're, we're being making merry, uh, and that's okay. That's okay. We have. Oh, I'm sorry. So how do I do this again? It's it's Watch Me Work. I'm Susan Lloyd Parks. We've been doing this for 11 years, mostly in the lobby of the Public Theater, where we would gather um, and uh, talk about uh, the audience's creative work and their creative process. And for 11 years, we've been gathering in the public theater, much thanks to the public theater for supporting this endeavor of mine and ours. Um, and then a few years ago, HowlRound came on and we started live streaming. And now HowlRound has joined together with the public theater to create this beautiful community um, during these difficult and exciting and abundant times. I could use more adjectives, but I'll, but I'll stop there. Um, today, we have an awesome, special, cool guest. Um, righteous man, great writer, truth teller, breaker of barriers. Someone who, as I was telling him a minute ago, is always so well-dressed. Um, <laughs> and he's David Henry Wong. And his stage works include plays in Butterfly and Chinglish and Yellowface, Kung Fu, Golden Child, the Dance and the Railroad and FOB, as well as Broadway musicals with people like Elton John and Tim Rice um, and uh, Flower Drum Song, the revival of Fl Flower Drum Song in, 20, in uh, 2002, sorry, having trouble reading, and also Disney's Tarzan. Um, David Henry Wong is a Tony Award winning writer. Yeah, a three time nominee, shit man. <laughs> Look at you, a three-time Obie Award winner and a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Also, also, he wrote the book uh, for the brilliant and moving musical Soft Power, which I saw last season at the Public Theater and absolutely loved it. We are okay. thrilled to have you, thrilled to have you, David, joining our, our, uh, our crew, our, our squad today. Um, what we do in Watch Me Work is we work together for 15 minutes and it doesn't have to be on write, uh, it doesn't have to be a writing project. It can be any kind of project you want. And um, we work together for, did I say 15 minutes? No, I'm blabbling today. 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. I was marching yesterday. It was very interesting. Um, very moving. 20 minutes today, we work together. And then we will ask David questions about his work and his creative process for a little bit. And then we will open it up to you all so you can ask David questions about your work and your creative process. And if anybody's confused, Audrey will tell you. Audrey will explain everything to you. So Audrey. Hey, hey everybody. Thank you for being here as always today. Um, as a reminder, if you want to ask questions and you are inside of the Zoom, all you need to do is click on the raise your hand button, which should be on the bottom of your screen on a participant tab if you're on a laptop, or the top of your screen if you're on an iPad or a tablet. Um, if you're watching on HowlRound.tv, you can tweet at us at, at WatchMeWorkSLP with the hashtag HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D, or you can tweet at Public Theater NY or go into our Instagram as well. And that's all. Okay, so it's real simple. It's really fun. All we're going to do is work together for 20 minutes, and then we'll talk with David about his work, and then encourage David to talk with you about your work. Okay, so here we go. Here we go.
is the bell. Hope you all got some some work done, or at least had fun sitting uh, sitting or standing. Hey, so we've got some questions for you, David. Hopefully, they're not too hard. <laughs> you're, you're hi, not, <laughs> hi, hi. Yes, you're here. So here's the first yeah. question. Here's the first question. What are you working on these days, man? Tell us. Oh okay. well, you know, as everybody knows. Um, many productions have been postponed mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we are uh, hoping to do is bring um, a, you know the next iteration of soft power into a commercial production so I'm continuing to work on that um, and then I'm kind of interested in the play I've just I was doing a little research on it just now I'm sort of interested and in particularly based on the moment that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Based on, um, in, you know, I, so I feel like there's a, a like, a, like white people are facing the fact that by 2040 or so, they're going to be a plurality, no longer majority. And then there's a certain segment, which is, you know, sort of represented by the Trumpist impulse that's sort of going, you know, we should just blow it all up. And I'm kind of interested in that. And, and then I believe there is a reflection, there's a sort of historical um, fact that is about the British empire destroying a lot of stuff in the Raj when they, you know, as they were withdrawing. So, Again, they sort of lost, they were losing it and they just felt, well, let's just destroy, you know, destroy this. We can't have it, then nobody can have it. And I'm wondering if that might be an interesting historical parallel to the current moment. Um, so I'm doing some research on that. And then, um, you know, uh, a fair amount of film and TV stuff because that uh, writers are working in film and television right now. Are working in, in film and television. Uh, do you work on more than one thing at once? I do. Yeah. Um, because, you know, partially because it takes so long for anything to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you only worked on one thing and you're waiting for it to get produced, then you just wouldn't get much done. Um, so, yeah, at the moment I'm writing uh, the, so, you know how all of the 90s <laughs> Disney animated movies are becoming live action features. So I've been working for about a year on the Hunchback of Notre Dame um, because I just, I had this really, you know, I was only interested in it as a way to explore um, refugees and, um, and immigration um, and the sort of, you know, uh, isolationist nationalist impulse that we're going through now. And I thought Hunchback of Notre Dame was a good uh, vehicle to do that. And I had this pretty radical pitch on it um, to, to Disney Studios and they went for it and the process has been going quite well. I think we're pretty close to being able to, they, you know, they'll want to add a director to it. So there's that and uh, working on a movie for um, Gemma Chan, who some of you might know from Crazy Rich Asian. She played Astrid. She's the sort of Hepburn-esque one um, for Gemma to play Anna Mae Wong. Uh, in a in a biopic, and Anna Mae Wong is sort of having a moment now. If anybody has watched um, Hollywood on Netflix, you know Michelle Krusek is playing Anna Mae Wong, um, and I think Lucy Liu also wants to play Anna Mae Wong. There's just like a Anna Mae Wong's having you know having a thing now. Do you have a preference for theater stuff or? film television stuff? Do you I mean, I, I, theater is still the, the medium that I feel most comfortable in. It's the mm -hmm. medium there I, I can be the most personal mm -hmm. uh, where I can just write the weird thing that I want to write. Mm -hmm. um, and also I like that theater is um, metaphorical. Mm -hmm. Somehow that appeals to me, the sort of meta aspects of it. And I, you know, I, I do meta things a lot in my shows and, 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 and sort of theatricalism was uh -huh. the term that was used in the 70s. Um, and I like that, you know, it's not, we're not even trying, I think a lot of theater, the theater that I like, we're not even trying to be realistic. We're trying to acknowledge that this is an, an artificial space 
And it's about the relationship between the live actors and the live audience and really um, take advantage of that. Um, and I like all that. Mm -hmm. When you work on more than one project at, at once, how do you divide the time? We, we talk a lot about that in here, just dividing up the time. How do you, do you have a, a tried and true method or? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't know that I've been trying. I mean, I usually write in the mornings first. Okay. So, uh -huh. so uh -huh. in the afternoons, like at this hour, I'm doing research. Well, just now I was doing some research and stuff uh -huh. and write. And I can work on an outline in the afternoon, but I can't really write right in the uh -huh. afternoon. Uh -huh. um, so I would really prefer not to write more than one thing a day mm -hmm. um, because I can, you know, I can shift gears from day to day but it's kind of, I only have so much writing mojo in any given day. Mm -hmm. And then if I, you know, use it on one project uh, and then I go to another project, it's, I, I feel like it's the second project gets short shrift. Mm -hmm. So, and in some sense, as I said, I feel like the outlining process, which I wouldn't do for a play by and large, but would do for, you know, film and television, the outlining process is a different muscle, different enough mm -hmm. muscle that I can do that in the afternoon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you would divide up your days. Morning is for writing. It would be for writing, writing. Yeah. Uh, afternoon, maybe research. Or afternoon, outline. yeah, research. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the mm -hmm. old, you know, uh, 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 up mm -hmm. until what eleven weeks ago, it would be you know lunches and meetings, and now right. it's you know right. Zoom meetings uh, and um, emails, of course. Yeah. So are you getting more work done now? You know, I'm having more meetings, which is weird because uh -huh. I mean, it's not weird because there's no um, there's no commuting time figured in. Right. But some days you just get like a meeting and a meeting and a meeting. Like, right. you know, in the right. old days, you would have to at least go to the other place. Right. Right. And producers are sitting around, you know, poolside in Los Angeles and they're like, what are we going to do? Let's have yeah. some meetings. Let's look up some all they can do right. is develop, um, you know, all they can do is develop scripts. And, uh, and there, well, there's editing going on and there's animation, that's mm -hmm. about it. Right, 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 right. So what about uh, these times that we're in? Um, you know, we had Blackout Tuesday yesterday and it's, it's been very, um, you know, as if COVID weren't, weren't enough. Yeah. Um, uh, things have gotten more challenging, more gnarly, in a, in a way, more, more vibrant in a way, you know? Yeah, you, I mean... What do you think? I'm kind of hopeful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a horrible moment. The history, the American history in terms of race and particularly as the, you know, relates to uh, Black people um, has been horrible. So that's not new. That's just something that is being highlighted at this moment. And mm -hmm. I'm glad that there's so much energy mm -hmm. um, and so many people willing to come out um, and um, say that things need to change. So I'm kind of hopeful that maybe something will change. And in terms of my own involvement, mm -hmm. um, it's been, you know, I've been just trying to figure out what uh, organizations to support and, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Minneapolis Freedom and mm -hmm. Reclaim the Block and trying mm -hmm. to find more sort of, you know, um, organizations young, run by um, black youth mm -hmm. um, and and then because I'm chair of the American Theater Wing uh -huh. uh, we've been trying I have been for four years and my term was supposed to be over at the oh. end of June and I was like counting the days and now they're going to make me extend for another year uh oh um, mm -hmm. which is like and you know it's anyway mm -hmm. but um <laughs> Yeah, like how do we use those resources mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to um, combat anti-blackness on Broadway mm -hmm. and uh, and off Broadway because the, the the theater wing now is is sort of national and covers off Broadway mm -hmm. as well. Um, and yeah, we're talking about a, f a few a, f a few initiatives um, and what sort of funds can we create? Um, and you know, I'm obviously very interested in people of color in theater in general, but I happen to think that this is uh, particularly a black moment mm -hmm. and um, to, to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, I mean, I, I hope I'm right in saying this, you're no stranger to violence that could yeah. be motivated by race. I yeah. mean, and and um, 
what do you do you think that the artist or the writer has a particular obligation during these times i mean i mean I hate to say that people have obligations because I feel mm -hmm. like the artist should write and create about what they want to uh, create. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it you know if you're doing something because you're supposed to be doing it, sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like that the work isn't that great. And then if the work isn't that great, then it doesn't really help anyone anyway. Um, <laughs> so all I can say is where I'm concerned mm -hmm. from the beginning of my career, I think this, and but. To this day, the thing that excites me the most is when I feel that I'm working on something that addresses the moment mm -hmm. or could, you know, could nudge the conversation um, in a direction of, of, you know, progressive social change. And that's why even like with something with like Hunchback, like I wouldn't be able to feel excited about doing it, except that there is an angle uh, that you could call political right. that... Uh, that I was into. And yeah, I, you know, right before this moment, uh, this sort of George Floyd moment, I was very focused um, on um, hate crimes against Asians, because obviously, that's a very hard time to, uh, to be Asian right now. And um, yes, not only was I, I mean, I was stabbed in the neck a few years ago, um, which may or may not have been a hate crime, but so many of uh, m myself and like, Francis Jew, who played, you know, DHH in uh, Yellowface, and uh, Tai Ma, an actor I've worked with a lot. I mean, we've all been yelled at, or, um, you know, and it's it after being Asian during COVID. Um, and so, but I think, you know, this particular moment is about focusing on uh, anti Blackness and mm -hmm. uh, police brutality mm -hmm. against uh, mm -hmm. African Americans. Mm -hmm. What about the burden? I mean, I, I'm going off script. Usually they give me questions to answer you. I'm just preforming here. So, right. What about, what you know, I, I sometimes out. feel, uh, yeah, right. I mean, I sometimes feel, or, you know, I talk to my students or, you know, um, there is, or maybe one might feel um, that for a, a person of color who's an artist, there is an additional burden. Um, that we have to carry. It's not just enough to, for example, it's not just enough to come up with a great pitch that's going to make Hunchback and Notre Dame fantastic. You know what I mean? Um, we wouldn't be interested in it unless it had an angle. I'm just, I'm interested, I guess, I mean, for example, my day, my regular work day in the past week or so has been um, in addition to the regular, all the work stuff, right? Um, I have these meetings with these big fancy hoo-ha CEOs from big fancy Hollywood companies because they want me to sit in on their staff meetings to talk to their staff. There's an added, what do we yeah. do with that? I mean, I'm not, it's not a complaint. I mean, it's, it's, you know, something that as an artist of color, maybe we have to deal with more or I've told some of my students like, that's the price of the ticket, you know, um, celebrate it. I mean, I guess my feeling is, none of us has to do it sure. so i there are probably i'm sure there are probably artists of color who get asked to do these things and they don't feel like doing it and they don't so i and i think you should only do it if you want to do it sure um because otherwise again it's, it's sort of like only if you want to write about this stuff it's great and if you don't actually want to do it and you're just kind of doing it because you feel you should then you're just going through the motions right. uh, i personally really like to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's been a lot of it lately. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can get tired of it. But I, I in principle, I, I mean, it's weird. I think I just, I discovered my voice as a writer. At the same time, I discovered my, you know, identity as an Asian American. It came together. Mm -hmm. I discovered it through the writing. And so I think those two things have always been linked for me in my sort of creative DNA. And that's just, True for me, I'm sure it's not, you know, it's a million different ways for other people. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. No, that's, a, that's right. I love what you're saying about not feeling like you have to do it, right? But feel, and of course, I, of course I'm doing them because I want to, but, but that sort of, you know, you think of hours in the day and you think, wow, you know, this is, my, my day is a little more cluttered yeah. because of, it's an interesting, just, just, yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
So uh, you feel like uh, taking some questions from our fabulous sure. assembled people? Okay, yeah, Audrey, take it away. Take it away, Audrey. Hey. Um, all right, I will call out uh, someone. Hi, um, Vernita, you are up first. Unmute, are you unmuted? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Hi, SLP, hi, David, hi, Audrey. Um, so speaking of this moment in time, I, I know I've raised my hand a couple times in the recent um, workshops that um, <clears throat> I finished uh, an article uh, on my, yeah, I'm like, I did it. Um, and it was a definitely a challenging pr process to create, I wanted to create a positive framework around this moment talking about uplifting uh, black men and, um, and of course, racial justice and all those things. And um, we had a, a question from the group a couple of days ago about um, writing and have being concerned about triggering people. And so, and I loved your uh, SLP's response to that. Um, I'm on the flip side now, I'm the writer. I'm excited to make people think, to get critical. And the editor of this platform, who is also a black woman said, ooh, ah, do we have to be so graphic? I'm concerned about tr our triggering our readers. And so just any thoughts on kind of managing, um, pushing the envelope a bit, you know, it's not a social justice platform that I'm writing on, but I also feel like we can trust their readers of these predominantly, you know, professional uh, black women to be able to digest this, because they're also going through it themselves right now to digest this material and that it doesn't have to all be um, flowers and yoga mats. Like we can talk about some real stuff and come back to the feel good ending of finding healing and inspiration around uplifting black men. I don't know, any thoughts? The, it, the piece hasn't been published yet. I have just, I have finished written writing it. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that this is a moment when people don't really want flowers and, you know, I mean, we're all in so much kind of conflict and uh, turmoil that this is, uh, that anything that's going to be, speak to people and be meaningful, I think needs to touch into that at least and then if it happens to end with the positive ending that's like even better that's like going through you know that's what everybody wants um i mean in terms of triggers per se i don't know what i i'm not exactly obviously i don't know what your piece is and congratulations for uh finishing it but um in terms of triggers per se i i don't know i feel like as artists of course we need to write what we feel and what is most meaningful to us. And I think it's okay to, if, if, if someone wants to put like some kind of warning on my, like the same, you're watching a, you know, documentary on Netflix and or whatever, and it says, you know, this contains nudity, smoking and whatever. And I'm okay with that. Um, I don't want anyone to tell me what to write or not, right? So if they want to say, well, these elements might be triggering, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you. That's thank helpful. You. All right, thank you so much. All right, up next, we have got Jennifer. Jennifer, are you there? Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I personally just want to say that, like, as an Asian playwright, um, trying to find Chinatown was my first anthology um, <laughs> of plays that I ever got, and it means so much to me. So, like, kind of to that degree, um, as I've begun like exploring my own Asian American identity as a playwright, I've begun to get into this like mindset of doubt where I keep thinking like, am I representing my community correctly? Like, am I like doing justice to this culture, to these people? And I've found that it's starting to like hinder my writing and starting to hinder my ability to just like put words on the page. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that and about like 
that idea of representing your community, but also being true to your own voice? Yeah, so, you know, when my first play was produced, um, it was at the public and it was called FOB and it was a play that I wrote to be done in my dorm. And then it, uh, it I eventually got to the public. Um, and there was an Asian American publication at that time uh, called the San Francisco Journal. And they re re reviewed my show and they said that I set Asian America back 20 years. And I was only 22 at the time. So, um, so I think that, you know, what that taught me was that there's always going to be some, the people, when you, particularly when you have people that haven't been represented very often in mainstream media, they're going to be extra sensitive and critical, um, and some are really going to love it, um, but they're going to evaluate much more closely what it is that you've written. And, you know, and they should really, because that's what we do with any piece of art. Like if, you know, if you're watching a Marvel movie, um, you and your friends are going to talk about, you know, I hated this or I love this. Because I think that the final piece in any collaboration is the audience, right? And that the audience, particularly true in theater. And so there are elements of the audience that are going to go, or if we're talking about, talking about Asian Americans, they're going to be, well, I really like, you know, I don't like David Wong's work, but I love Jessica Hagedorn's work. Or I, and you know, that's good. I mean, obviously, ideally, I want everybody to like my work, but it's really good when there's, and people have opinions about things and they identify because it helps them go, okay, well, that experience that's being portrayed is closer to my own and I identify that one. I don't really identify with that one, but you know, that there's a, that there's a range of stories that people can choose to identify with or not, or like or not is good. That's what we do. So, and so then that's a long way of saying the important thing is to write from your own truth because it's like any, like what I was saying earlier, if you do something because you're supposed to be doing it, then the work might not be particularly good. If you write what's true to you, then that's going to be the unique show that only you could write. And some people are going to like it and some people are going to think it's fake and that's okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, all right, up next, we've got Melania and we've got about 10 more minutes. Melania, go for it. Yes, hello. Hi, Susan, hi, David. Hi. And thank you for being here. Um, I am trying to write a theater play for children and I, we are talking with Susan. Um, what I am seeing in myself is that you said something that got to me very deeply that you discover your voice through the, your writing. And I am trying to do that, to, to see what, what my voice is. What do I want to say? What is happening to me? And I am discovering through the writing that there are moments that are very nice and I enjoy, and there are some other moments that I want to run away and, you know, leave everything. So, and I see that you love to write for children also, and, and I see that you respect and you treat children in a very serious way with, with respect. So I would like to know a little bit more about this journey that you had in discovering your own voice and know how you do your work when you write for children because I am trying to discover that and I know that is something that maybe is my own journey but it would be great for me to to know your experience. Yeah so I um, the summer before my senior year in college I uh, got to study with um, somebody who is I think maybe the great playwriting teacher of her generation uh, Maria Irene Fornes. Um, <laughs> And Irene, uh, and, and I also that was at a, something called the Padre Hills Playwrights Festival. And Sam Shepard was there also, and he taught. He was great also. Um, wow. But they taught us to write more from our subconscious. So your, your conscious mind is the part of you that says, um, oh, is this any good? 
Are, am I writing the right thing? Is, does anybody care? Who do, you, who do I think I am? And the subconscious is more the, you know, your id, your impulse, the part that doesn't make sense sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, you know, creating a play or any work of art is balancing those two things. It's balancing your conscious and your subconscious, your, you know, id and your uh, 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 superego. Mm -hmm. And so, but the, I, I think the thing that's sometimes hard is for us to access the subconscious. Um, and so, you know, one really easy exercise or obvious exercise is that you just write as fast as you can, you don't stop. Um, and therefore it's impossible for you to censor yourself. Uh, there's an exercise that I love where, that Irene gave, where you start writing a scene. Uh, this takes two people though. And then somebody else starts throwing in random words or phrases. And it's your job to incorporate that into the dialogue. And you find that, you know, even when you're forced to do something which is just arbitrary, um, that some, in most cases, the scene gets better. When, you're, when you have to struggle with things that you don't understand. And so it was in doing that, that see, I just wanted to be a playwright. I didn't know I wanted to write about like Asian stuff, Asian American stuff. But as I started to do this and just let myself be more free, I found that these themes started appearing on the page, you know, like immigration, clash of cultures. And so that's how I began to discover that, oh, I'm very interested in this stuff. Um, I, I found it through the work. In terms of writing for young people, I mean, I don't think it's that different really from writing for adults, um, except that, I don't know, I don't, I don't even, I, I guess you try to, you know, there are obvious things I would stay away from, um, you know, just in terms of sexuality or you know explicit sexuality and you know certain language things but other than that I don't think it's that different I I, I, I think it's just this the story I wrote a play my second play to be produced in New York was called The Dance in the Railroad and I wrote it um, it was thank you and it was a it was a, a commission for young for for school kids um, and it was, it's hard to believe, but this was a time when the U.S. Department of Education was commissioning plays. So it was commissioned to be done at what used to be called the New Federal Theater, which is now, now has a different name. I can't remember the name, but it's on the Lower East Side. Um, and uh, we did it and they bust in school kids. And then one day, uh, Frank Rich, who was then the head, head critic for the Times, came to see it. He gave it a good review. And Joe Pat moved it to the public and it became an adult play. So I, I really don't know the difference that well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melania. Good to see you. Um, all right. It's got about six minutes left. We're going to go to Angela. Angela, hey there. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Angela and uh, um, you spoke about your process for writing plays, like, uh, for example, you um, write, like, in the afternoons or um, in, like, how you, like, use an outline and stuff like that. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions for conducting research for your plays, because there's times when I would be writing and then I would get stuck at the part where I want to incorporate research and uh, it might be kind of hard to find exactly um, the answer to the question that I'm looking for. And yeah, I would get stuck at that point. Yeah, so I have a weird attitude <laughs> towards research. Okay, a couple of things. I believe in doing research, but I kind of tend to believe in doing it before I write the play. And then I feel like you have to, I have to forget my research when I'm writing the play. Because it's easy to get like hung up on the research or especially if you, I do a lot of research, it's easy to like show off my, like, oh wait, I, I remember like this weird thing. And I really want to include that because I, you know, I'm going to show off my research. Whereas the thing that I really need to focus on is, you know, writing, writing the play and writing a play that works. Um, 
so so there's that and then i also like i'm you know probably still best known for m butterfly and m butterfly was a show that was based on a real story you know about a french diplomat who had a 20-year affair with a chinese actress who turned out to be a spy and b what we would now call biologically male and the diplomat claimed that he never knew the true gender of his lover so this is based on a true story and i really wanted to research it but it was the late 80s this is like before there was internet it was like happened in france so they were all french papers so i couldn't do much research i just wrote it so i just made it all up um and it actually worked out pretty well so i'm i, I think that if you're at a point where you are writing something and you feel like you need to do more research but you're writing i would just like keep writing i i would you know I, I would say, I mean, I don't know what your project is and I don't know how critical the research is to going forward. Like if it's a docu-drama, obviously it's different. But it's if, it, if it's a play, just keep going, just make it up, you know? And then you can like check later and you can like move things around if you need to. But I would just make it up. That's what I always did. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, all right, do we have time, I think, for one more question? Andrea or Andrea, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Are you unmuted? Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I had the question last time about triggering, so it came back up, which is cool. Um, but this actually connects to Angela's question um, about the research and getting bogged down in, in the, and I, I, I very much get bogged down in theory and research, and this is what happened. And I'm wondering for you, you talked about doing the research before and then just kind of letting it go how like who, who, how do you depart from it and because i feel like it can mess with your imagination a little bit when you're so encompassed in you know what really happened yeah i think the way to let it go is just not to open the book or not to go to the website because <laughs> i like to believe that the stuff that's really important is going to stick in my head and if i don't remember it it wasn't that important mm. Yeah, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This has been so fun. Um, I think we've got about 50 seconds left, and I don't think we have any more hands. So is there anything we there's want to a, wrap up? There's, oh, a que there's a question in the chat. Triggers aside, is it unethical oh. to use violence, specifically DV in a novel? What's, I mean, what is DV? I don't know. This is Catherine? Uh, Catherine, are you okay? Oh, domestic violence. Get, yeah, it usually stands for domestic violence. Oh. Thanks, yeah. Um, I don't, oh, thank you. I don't think there's anything specifically unethical, it, particularly if you're writing about domestic violence. I don't know how you don't include domestic violence. So I guess I would have to say it depends on context. Gotcha. All right. It's just about six o'clock. We're so lucky that you're with us. Oh, thank you. Thanks, period. Thank you. We're so lucky. You're, yeah, really. Um, what, what a joy you are and what an inspiration, David. Um, just, I, I just love the way you, you, you think and feel and, and do your craft. Thanks. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is yeah. legendary what you do here. Well, it's, Lurie, it's an so. open invitation. The carpet okay. is always unrolled. And then you always, if you want it, you know, feel like, Jesus, okay. I'm kind of bored this afternoon. Come drop in and, and dispense your wisdom, please, because it's okay. so, so, so very helpful. Um, and I just love, I was just sitting here going, no, oh, I just love listening to you. Oh, um, well, thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're, watch me work. Thanks, David Henry Wong. We're so lucky to have you here. Always welcome back. Uh, we will be back uh, tomorrow. Well, we will be back do kind of pretty much the same thing. Yeah. The As a reminder, sign up by 3 p.m. Eastern every single day um, that we have a session, and I'll send you a link between 3 and 4.30 p.m. if you want to be in the Zoom. Great. Thank Happy you. writing, everybody. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Love Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, SLP. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. <laughs>